Well, Dean, thank you so much for being with me today. Truly, with I saw this on my calendar. I saw this opportunity to connect, to have conversation, to learn from your journey, your wisdom. And I've been so excited to connect with you. And one of the things I just want to recognize you before we get going is that we all learn these little bits of wisdom along life. We learn ways to live, the way to operate, the way to connect with others. But so often people don't share that wisdom. They keep it to themselves and they don't put themselves out there. And so I just want to recognize you before we get going in sharing your wisdom and this truth to understand of really how to measure ourselves in a healthy way, how to evaluate our goals and the way we're living and such a powerful piece of wisdom. So thank you so much for putting that out there. And I can't wait to have this conversation with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It should be fun. It should be fun. <clears throat> so um, I don't traditionally do this, um, but I kind of get, you know, at the beginning of this, I gave a little intro to the accident um, that you had with the bale hay and, and what that impacted had in your life sure. um, physically. But one of the things I'm really curious for you is you've overcome some, you know, really challenging circumstance, something that you didn't invite upon yourself. Like that, that accident was not on your outlook calendar. That was not planned, obviously. Right. But yeah. you've persevered through that and you've come, you know, you come to this new place of understanding. And I'm curious, I call it a new one. I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm curious as you reflect on that journey. Okay. From somebody who did not need a wheelchair to somebody who uses a wheelchair as a tool and where you are today, as you think about that journey was, and you think about pre and post, right? If I can kind of take you into that space for a moment, if you will, is the, do you think about, or have you ever thought about what was it about myself? What values, what core principles, what foundational beliefs allowed me to transition through that in the way that I did that had I not had those pieces, maybe I would have approached that situation differently. Yeah, it's, um, it's almost crazy to think, right? So you kind of started off with the idea. It didn't ask me for permission, right? So, Hey, what if we did this to you? I'm like, I think that's okay. You know, and it, you don't get asked that stuff, right? It just happens in the moment. And the, the interesting thing is, I think over time, I learned that so many of the things that were a part of who I was that had been buried, honestly, for quite a while, came to the forefront. Uh, so all of the mentoring, coaching, the positive people in my life, my family, my, my parents, you know, you get, you get told stuff growing up, you get guided growing up, and they hope you make the right decision. Um, but it's amazing how many of those foundational pieces are there when you need to call on them. And, and the question is, can you, can you bring those out? So, you know, a lot of, a lot of my background might've been through athletics. It might've been even being in the band, right. It, it, you know, friendships and all those sorts of things. Um, the ability to compete and to draw on some of those experiences really started to, to come together. But yeah, it's, it's interesting how quick it happened for me from a, all right, it happened. Now what? And, and what's next? Uh, I had some people nudging me along the way, obviously. Um, you know, it, it, it was it was interesting looking back in that while I was in the midst of the trauma before ambulance arrived, before helicopter arrived, um, you know, you you have time to talk, right? Because <laughs> you really don't know what's going on or what tomorrow is going to be or if he's even going to be there. Mm. And when, when help arrived, being that I live in a small community, it was interesting that that help were my friends. Oh man. The volunteer EMT, the volunteer fire, those are my buddies. Right. And to know and hear their voices while they were helping me was really interesting. It's like, all right, I'm, I'm cool. My friends are here. I'm going to be all right. And, you know, certainly the transition happened and, and, and some of those things, but it's, it's crazy how what becomes a normal day for me is really based on all of the things that have been embedded in us. We've always been a hardworking family, even, you know, as, as kids, you know, it wasn't about getting paid to do chores. It was, you're going to do chores. You know, nowadays kids think they need paid for everything. Right. Um, but you know, we, we did chores because it was responsibility for us to do or our parents expected that and i think that work hard play hard mentality 
um, really helped transition quite a bit. So beyond the work ethic, which I agree with you, like I grew up in a small community, my parents had their own business, like there was, there was the list of things you needed to do on Saturday before you went to go do anything on the refrigerator, right? right. It was just, that's what you had to do. That was, you know, um, and you didn't want to cross my mother if you didn't do them, right? <laughs> so yeah. uh, she didn't need to call my dad for backup. She had it well handled with two boys. Um, so beyond the hard work, that work ethic, like you said you anchored to some wisdom that people had shared with you through your yeah. life. Like, was there anything as you, as you think about that moment, and I imagine you've had many since then, was there anything that you think of specifically that was a more powerful tool for you or yeah. a, a, a belief system that you held potentially that helped you, pow, you know, move forward from that pretty impactful moment? Yeah, I think uh, one, one of the huge influences that doesn't really come out in in some of the things that have, you know, the talk and, and stuff that we've given online, um, I was lucky enough to have a college football coach that was 65 years old. He had forgotten about more football than I would ever see at that time. Um, I played for a small Division III NCAA school, right? So it's non-scholarship. If you love the game, you show up and play. And he instilled some things immediately with the camaraderie, the culture, and all those things that come to play. And it's things that you don't really think about at the time. But nowadays, I can call on any one of those 100 teammates, and it's like we've never missed a beat in 25 years. But there are specific things that he would call out in practice or at the end of practice, little talks about life as opposed to football. Um, and we were good. We, we, we did quite well every Saturday, but the, the end of practice talks like telling you it's okay to have a bad play. It's okay. If you have one, what's not okay is not recognizing that and not evaluating it and then doing something about it. And, you know, you think about some of the things that, that I try to go through, I kind of correlated that to meaning it's okay to have a bad day. And, mm. And, and, and the thing is, it's, you're not a failure. You're not, you're not doing anything wrong. It's just a bad day. Um, and if you can compartmentalize that and figure that stuff out, um, you can get past it so much quicker. But it really comes down to, and I think his message was, do you have the guts to evaluate yourself? Not beat yourself up, but just, just ask the question, was it better than yesterday or not? And if it wasn't, that's cool. You got tomorrow to think about and to make that happen. Um, you know, that translated in today's world to me in terms of how quick can I evolve or move on from something that might not be going the way that I want it to go. Um, you know, we, I work in an IT organization. We often have meetings that can get contentious as we're trying to, to figure out what we're going to do next. And it's never a personal attack on anybody, but we get anxious with each other and you could let that ruin things and you could take it all the way home to dinner time with your family, which isn't fair to them, or you can just wipe it clean and, and move on. And I think a big part of a big part of the success we had on the football field was based on those things. And it, it translates today in that I help coach our high school girls basketball team. My daughter's on the team. I'm lucky to, to have an opportunity to be with her at practice. Uh, but basketball moves so fast. You, you have, you don't have time to roll your eyes at the referee. You don't have time to react. The ball's gone at the other end of the court. And so we really focus on the girls understanding that the details that they put into practice um, are not about basketball. It's about that job that you're going to interview for the promotion you're going to be up for. And Oh, by the way, let's play some basketball. Right. Yep. And, and I think had, had, I not had that college coach and some of those teachings as well as the culture and the teammates that I had and those friends I still have and how that's transitioned to do hopefully what I'm doing to help our girls out. Um, it'd be a different situation. It'd be, I'd be in a, a real different place. I think. Yeah, that's really powerful. There's some really beautiful wisdom in that. And I think one of the things that, you know, for many of us, many of us is that we hold on to, we take, you know, you're still worrying about the last play. Like I think about, you know, pitchers, for example, or quarterbacks, yeah. right? Those two positions, yeah. right? Is 
when the pitcher gives up the home run ball, when the quarterback throws the interception, right? Mm -hmm. The pick six specifically, right? So yeah. the next offensive play, right? Just, you yeah. know, other than the field goal kick, right? But like the real sure. next offensive play is you got to pick the pick skin up again, right? Yeah. Or you got to take that ball and put it back in your mitt and put right. that home run, put mm -hmm. that pick six out of your mind and go again. And, yeah. you know, and if you don't, you're probably going to throw another pick six. Or you're probably going to give up another home run, yeah. right? If you don't leave that bad play behind you. And, you know, I've got an eight, a six, a two-year-old, and our fourth one on the way. And I was talking to my daughter who plays softball is mm -hmm. here's my only expectation for you. This is a team sport. You can't control whether you win the game or lose the game. Mm -hmm. There's only two things you can, you can control, right, when you're on the field. She's like, what's that, Dad? I was like, do you do your absolute best mm -hmm. every play, right? Do you stay in the game? Do you stay focused? Do you do your best? Whatever that looks like, right? Yeah. And do you have fun? Do you have a positive attitude, right? And um, one of her games, she she fielded the, the ball at third. She was playing third base, flubs it, picks it up, runner's running, and she dives and tags this runner out nice. as a second grader, right? She just dives. Yeah. The, the coach is going crazy. Her players yeah, yeah. are going crazy. And we, we got done. And I didn't congratulate her for the out. That was pretty epic. I congratulated yeah. her because I knew that was 100% effort. That was yeah. a 100% effort effort moment. Yeah. And so what I hear you saying is that a big piece for you is something very similar. Is it one, you've always been a hundred percent guy and yeah. two, that in your life, you've recognized that we're all going to have bad days. We're all going to have bad plays, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's the home run ball, the pick six, whatever sports analogy you want to use, but you got to put it out of your mind and take that next step forward. You know, and, and there's so many things. I spent my weekend with my 17-year-old playing softball. Um, she may not agree. I think it's her best sport. It's not her favorite. But shoot, this weekend, five for nine, four doubles, six RBI. I mean, she 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 played really well, right? Yeah, it's um, a solid day. Up, she, she was upset because she said, I didn't hit the ball where I wanted to. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> it hit the <laughs> fence. And you, I mean, but um, there's something about the bad day thing I think is really interesting. And, and you see it with the young kids as well. Um, I know, and, and maybe all of us do, I know when the alarm goes off some days, uh, if it's going to be a rough day, right? I, I can tell my, my legs are kind of buzzing, which is, a, we can get into that if you wish, but I can just tell there's something about the day. It, it, it's kind of like when your parents would say, wow, the weather's changing, my body hurts. I never believed that until now I'm older and I'm like, oh my gosh, my, my body hurts today. So I have a choice. Do I dig in and dig my heels in and fight it all day? Or do I just say, ah, it's going to be what it is. And I think in that latter example, by the time noon comes, I've kind of forgotten about it. I haven't tried to grind through it and gnash my teeth. It's just like, I assume it and I embrace it and say, you know what, today is going to be one of those days. So let's just, just get through that. Right. And I think what's, what's interesting too about it all is as we, as we try to project that and set that example, um, you know, having having a, a player, a kid, family member understand the smile part of it, the work hard part of it. You know, growing up, we are taught and conditioned to try to be the best. You you need to make the team. You need to get this. You need to do that. And it's amazing how little time is spent on demanding them to be a good person or mm. to do it right. You know, there's so much competition about if you don't make the team. Where's that competition of being the best person you can be aside of that? And, and that's where the hypocritical nature of this comes in for me is like, you know, we can talk as if I've got it figured out. There's so many things that I still am trying to figure out. Right. I mean, all of us, no, nobody has it figured out. It might look like I am achieving something in a wheelchair that is a normal day for me, but there's so many other things that, that have to still be figured out. I think we all, I mean, I, so first and foremost, thank you for that. Cause I think hearing from somebody who's, you know, Boston marathon qualifying, qualifying wheelchair athlete, Ted, TEDx speaking, you know, individual, like all these things that you've achieved, it's very easy to go, well, you know, Dean's got, Dean's got this thing called life under control. Right. <laughs> and I, I love when people are extraordinarily transparent to say, look, mm -hmm. like I'm still growing. I'm not there. Right. Mm -hmm. I've got some wisdom in these specific areas, but I'm learning from other people in these areas of my life. 
And because there couldn't be anything more truer than that um, in all of it is that we are all growing some way. And if you aren't, right, if you're like, I've got it all figured out. Mm, I, I, I don't yeah. think so. I don't think so. So that whole, that whole next comment, you know, with the kids, we tell them there's, there's only one time in your life when there's not something next. Right. And that's last moment that you have alive. Right. But there's always something next and you have to keep moving forward with that. Yeah. My faith would lead, would lead me to believe there's still something next. Right. We, yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm with you with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, and, and here, here's like, I think and this is a key thing and it leads into your TEDx talk is that we, we so often it's like, well, you know, I didn't do what this person did. Right. So I was a marathon runner and I, I wanted to qualify for Boston. That was a really, really important goal for me. And I got my uh, marathon dime down to a three twenty two, And based on my age group, I needed to hit a three ten. It was never going to, and I know what I needed to do to get to three twenty two. What? That's flying. Yeah, I was moving. I, yeah, I was moving. Yeah, for yeah. Um, but I knew what I needed to do and what I had to put my body through to get down to a 322 and to shave another 12 minutes off my time. Um, at least I didn't have the I didn't know I didn't know how to. I did what I had available to me, I didn't know how to. Um, but it was always like I, I had this terrible, terrible perspective on my marathon running because I looked at it as though I had failed. Because it was all yeah. about hitting this arbitrary time that Boston yeah. declares that based upon how old I am, this is what yeah. it means to be a... So share with yeah. me for you, like as you've gone through this journey of how you measure Dean, mm -hmm. how did you understand... Like where did that understand... Tell us, tell us a little bit about the understanding for those who haven't seen the TED Talk and we'll link to it in the show notes so people make sure they do because uh, it's incredible. Sure. But talk to, us a little, talk to me a little bit about that understanding and how has that helped you achieve some of the things you have? Yeah, there's some there's some interesting things that are, again don't come out in the talk. In that, you know, I'm coming up in December will be 10 years in the wheelchair, which first of all is mind blowing that it's gone that fast. Um, but I I came home in 2012 in February, and in May I attended a track and field Paralympic camp if you will or or it wasn't even really a camp it was more of an exhibition where we could go to the track and and meet people and understand i was introduced to racing that day and it wasn't until four years later that i finally said hey maybe i should get into this racing thing and i'm kicking myself for this time that i could have been you know engaged and racing a lot a lot better and and i think the thing that's interesting when when it finally came about um i have such a strong support group friends community around me that i never joined the wheelchair basketball team i never joined the adaptive sports teams locally and such because i had so much other stuff i was i was doing they, they are they had me full of helping coach this and help the kids with that that um i didn't have time nor did i feel that i was missing a camaraderie ship or whatever like that. And so when the, the racing came around, it was really my physical therapist. I'll blame her for the pain <laughs> that, uh, um, no, seriously, she, I call her the captain of my team. She's in charge of, of what we're doing. She's just wonderful. And she was a runner and she convinced me to, to get after it. And she knew there was nobody for me to, to do anything to compare with. And it was really a matter of, her just simply saying track everything. I use Strava heavily. And, and so track everything, look back and just decide how you feel and take your, your time with that. And it wasn't until, um, you know, middle of the summer in, in 2016, where I got to thinking that maybe there's more to this. I'm really having a good time, but if I really want to get into this racing, how would I do that? And was lucky enough to have some folks respond to an email and get me started. And, you know, when, when you're doing that, first of all, when you look at a Paralympian, it's different than an Olympian. And, and there's something about that, meaning that when you think Olympian, you're thinking Usain Bolt, you're thinking a 20-year-old incredible athlete of some sort, right? 
the Paralympian, it's interesting how the wheelchair is a leveling factor. I mean, there are many Paralympians that are in their 30s, if not older. There are people that are 60 years old and so much faster than I am on a chair. And that it's, it's a leveling factor a little bit, right? And I'm, I'm by no means that caliber of an athlete, but I've been in the room with them and they will tell me hello, which I find nice, right? They recognize that I exist, but they're just everyday people and they're in a wheelchair as well. And it's interesting how that coach that helped me out continued to simply tell me to focus on me and work on my stroke and work on, you know, my plan and, and so on. And he would send me workout plans. And it's interesting, the workout plans have to deal with percentages of your ability, not you need to do this mileage in this time. And so everything is a percent of your max speed. So if my max speed is X, you're going to do this workout at 70% of that for 10 minutes. And so be it where your distance is, your goal is to hold that percentage and, and so on. And so every workout and every bit of guidance I received from them folks was focused on what I was able to do as opposed to looking at others that are, that are there. Right. Um, so how is that translated? Cause that's, that's, a, I, I want to, cause yeah. I don't want to go past that wisdom for a minute. Like sure. that's incredible. Right. And for those who aren't athletes who aren't mm -hmm. training at that level is percentage of max threshold and heart rate training, mm -hmm. heart rate zone training. Like, but there's a there's a powerful concept in that. How is that yeah. understanding of percentage of your best, percentage of your max, and yeah. you know, asking like how is that translated in other areas of your life for you? Yeah, and, and maybe just give more background to, to solidify it, right? So if I am I, I'm, I'm going to have really two kinds of workouts. I'm either going to be out on a trail or a city street or or something on pavement, or I'm going to be on my roller, which is essentially like a treadmill in the basement, right? And the roller is an easier way to understand the workout. Um, we'll do a warm up, and then you will have a, a 30 second time window after that warm up where you'll just go as fast as you possibly can. And you want to do this every day. And if your max speed ends up being 15 miles an hour, you then take a rest and you will calculate your percentages. So today's workout is going to be an 80%, then a 70, then a 60. You'll quickly jot down and say, all right, I need to hold 80% at whatever that is of 15 mile an hour and so on. And then the next day, guess what? You're back. And the next day you do another max speed effort. And over time, hopefully that max speed effort starts to, to get stronger and better. Right. And I think it really comes down to, um, understanding what your average is and this goes straight to the talk right if you're constantly testing what your max speed effort is you're going to slowly see that you're going to rise higher and higher and that becomes normal right i mean that that's what's interesting is a normal day for me an average day for me somebody might say wow how are you able to accomplish that i'm like well i've been doing that average day for a really long time um it's not um in, in my case it's not inspirational or motivational it's just my day and and through the years of doing that it it gets to be commonplace that way so if you think about racing you think about work performance and what you just challenge yourself every day to do um cooking i mean making a meal for your family doing your chores and there's always ways that you can think about what do i normally do how could i get that a little bit better and then hopefully that better becomes the norm and then you get a little bit better from there. Yeah. And I, and I think that's such an interesting way to live. Um, and I think it's one of those things where people often say, well, how can I make my life better? How can I grow? How can I be, you know, better tomorrow? And the reality is, is that's a formula. Like if you aren't paying attention to what Dean just said, let me, let me just paraphrase that and Dean and guide me if I, if I don't paraphrase that this properly, but like the key formula here, is that what Dean's doing is he's taking himself and gain, he's, you fail every day. When you're doing that training, you take yourself to max effort. Another way to say is, is failure. And then you operate at 80%, 70%, 60% of complete and total, absolute all out failure, mm -hmm. right? And then from there, because you're willing to fail, you're willing to go all the way in, then your ability to go further, that that max effort grows at the 80, the 70, and the 60, inch up because you're willing to go further, harder, deeper than, than not. It's a whole different formula. It's a whole different experience. If that max effort is on the, on, not on the front end of that. And so right. I just, I thought that was such a powerful component of that. I wanted to point yeah. that out. And, 
and failure is an interesting thought there too, in that um, almost always I will look back an hour later and say, well, I wasn't so bad, you know, and, and, and I was actually speaking with one of my friends who's um, going to be at the Paralympic trials trying to make Team USA here in a couple of months, right? Really good friend. Uh, she was my daughter's confirmation sponsor, in fact, right? And we talk almost every day. I'm old enough to be her dad, but she will put up with my questions about racing and she'll ask me about career. And so we share some wisdom there. And, and you know, she's constantly just telling me, don't be so down. Look back two years at what you tracked. And thankfully, the apps let us do that. And she's right. You know, two years ago, I was struggling to get to a speed that right now I just sit down and that's what we go at. It's just a normal thing. And it's so easy to lose sight of that. It's so easy to lose track of, you know, the the challenges you'd put yourself through that are now just regular day. Right? Just Tuesday, so, right? So even wheelchair, right? Getting out of bed, taking a shower, getting clothes on, having the balance to not fall over. All those things were a challenge the first week. And after a while, it's like, ah, no big deal. I, in fact, I used to count to three before I would launch into my chair. I'd be on the bed, I'm like one, two, and then I'd go. I'm like now I'm just, I just go, right? And it's, it's where I'd have to psych myself up to get ready to do this miniature gymnastics move to get into a wheelchair. And nowadays it's just a regular thing. And I think it's with anything else in life, right? You just roll into things that become commonplace. If it's new, you prep, right? I mean, you do some work. Um, but if it's not, just go with it. Yeah. And, and, and I think most of us, like we go through windows, we're getting out of bed is an heroic move, right? Mm -hmm. Like imagine you still have some days where you do the one, two, three, right? Oh yeah. Chair or not. Right. And I, and I think there's this gift that we can give ourselves to recognize you build a tool, right? Yours is counting to three to over, to, to deal with something that was new to your life. That was something you physically and mentally and emotionally needed to adjust to. Right mm -hmm. now, most days you don't need that. Right. Yeah. But I suspect sometimes you do like all of yeah. us do. Yeah. And I don't know what you went through when you were doing more of your running, uh, before the boot. Um, <laughs> Counting is a big deal in the racing chair, specifically on the roller. Um, 100 strokes a minute is, is pretty commonplace. And it doesn't seem like a lot for the first minute, but when you need to go three or four minutes that way, I am constantly counting in my head, trying to psych myself up to realize there's only 80 left, there's only 60 left, there's only 40 left before I can jog if you will right yes and, and that and that can be anything it can be just an extended jog versus whatever and i think you know as you're as you're getting through something difficult in life you're always thinking about when is it going to end but if you can find a way to not be a victim in that and and actually try to excel and push all the way to the end it makes all the difference as well back to that that failure discussion yeah so i ran so i injured the foot doing a 50 mile ultra marathon um and training for a 50 miler and I'm not i'm not going to do that no no. Um, and it's, you know, I think I, so I'm a, I'm a, um, advocate for doing hard things. Mm -hmm. Just, we have all have a different version of what hard means. So mm -hmm. for me, I built my endurance to a place where the unknown, the scary and the hard was 50, right? That could be a 10 K for somebody else. Um, yeah. so, and for me, um, you know, one of the things that I learned is that you can't run mile 50 until you run mile two, mm -hmm. right? And so to learn to be very, very present in the mile you're running, yeah. um, I think so much of us spend, we spend an enormous amount of time either in the past or the future, right? Whatever mm -hmm. that is, we have, we each have days, tendencies, you know, some of us are wired one direction or the other more likely than others, right? But I learned once I went beyond the 26.2, like how dangerous that was. And I was lucky to have heard from another ultra marathon runner, like be where your feet are, be in the mile. And mm -hmm. I applied that. And it's amazing how impactful that's been in relationships in business in, uh, in life in general of just being, like being okay, not having your mind someplace else and going some, so in counting is a way to do that. Like in, um, you know, I would, my first, um, my first, uh, 50 K 
I, which is 31 miles, mm -hmm. uh, it got ugly. It got ugly. And um, I mean, I just don't know another way to describe that. It just got, it was ugly. It was messy. Uh, mentally, I was toast. And so I started just counting my steps, right? Yeah. And I'm really curious how long I could just count my steps and be only counting my steps to bring myself back into the moment. So when right. you do that counting of the strokes, do you find that uh, to be a very centering process as well? Helps you keep it, focused in the moment? It, it does, and it centers my breathing on top of it, right? And and I think, you know, your, your breathing cadence, your running cadence, all those things apply. And, of course, the undulations of the road, the rises and the falls play as well. You know, being in the moment is interesting in that um, two years ago was my first and only Boston because, you know, we didn't have it last year. Um the first 17 ish miles of that race are screaming. I mean, we're, we're on a downhill plane for a lot of that race and people would ask, how was it? And I just, my mind is, it was quick. It was the first over half the race was gone so fast that I didn't really even realize where I was. We we're just head down pushing. Of course, then you get hit in the face pretty hard in that late part of the race with the Hills. Right. And, and it tells you you're human again, but that, that there's so many races that way that are, we're so intent on just going as fast as we can. And with us in the racing chair, we're looking down at the pavement or up in front a little bit, right? But there's a lot of times you're just looking down and, and getting through it. And that's, that's something I have to work work more with, but that that's a, a key part of it. And one of the challenges I have is in the training that I do, it seems that I end up on the same trails and the same paths and the same roads. And it gets monotonous and I have to find my find a way to challenge myself. And one way is to do that counting to try to get the pace faster and some of those things. Um, there are I, I won't go out on a county road or highway in my chair just for fear of getting run off the road. I, I just won't do it. So I have a lot of great places here in, in the area where I can be safe, but after a while you use them up. And so um, it, the monotony of it, the challenging yourself. Um, I totally understand that. Yeah, I I, uh, I ran a half. They have a half marathon. It's the way you've run the yeah. uh, ours here uh, called yeah, the, Indy, the Indy, Indy Mini, right? Mm -hmm. Runs around the Indianapolis 500 Motor Speedway. Sure. Um, yeah. I've ran it multiple times, as I understand you have well. Yeah. And I don't know if they still do this because it's been a number of years since I've ran that race. But they used to. You run by the Indianapolis Zoo, and they used to bring an elephant out. Oh no, I haven't been there with the elephant. Yeah. Nor have I, because I never noticed it. <laughs> Someone goes, hey, do you see the elephant? I'm like, what are you talking about? There was an elephant at the zoo. I'm like, they had an elephant out? It's just so tunnel vision, right? Yeah. And I have the ability to look left to right. And one of the things that, that um, has changed dramatically in my running is the when you're – so I do a lot of zone two heart rate training, so way slower than what I can run to build that – um, that endurance and is the ability to take in what you're mm -hmm. experiencing, to take in the yeah. journey. Right. And so yeah. I'm curious for you, as you've gone through this process of becoming, fuck. sorry, care for that word. Oh, there you are. Yep, I'm gonna make note. No, that's um, okay. I'm talking about going through the process. So, um, so we've um, continued to add more bandwidth and more bandwidth and more bandwidth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then we've hired people. I so I'm a financial advisor, right? So I've got employees that are working right now on that sure, sure. on that business, yeah. right? Um, yeah. yeah. And you can't tell people, hey, don't jump on, don't jump on that internet thing, right? And so, yeah. we've, and so we've upped our bandwidth to like, I'm like, this is nuts. And so I thought we had it completely resolved, and now right. um, I've had two. I had a cut out last week, and I just don't really enjoy that. So because it gives, it no, makes no, a lot no, of fun. So, 
Um, um, and now I started bitching. So remind me, what was I saying? Because you had told me. We were right talking about being in the moment, the elephant. Yes, that yes. Was there and yes, all that. thank yeah. you. Gosh, I normally am the one who does that for others. So thank you. Um, no, no, no for, you're good. Th- that's really kind of you. So so when as you've gone through this journey of, of being the athlete you are, being the, you know, the boss, like how has that helped you in other areas? Maybe connections with your wife, with your kids, with your mm-hmm. colleagues. Like how yeah. has this racing helped you in relationships with the people you love or the people you work with? Oh, wow. That's a big question. Um, I have a funny story about in the moment is it relates to the Indy mini. If, if you don't mind though, too, um, please. The last time I raced, last time I raced there, I had my GoPro on, uh, on the racing chair and then I sped it up on YouTube so you can watch the entire race like in eight minutes. Right. And, um, one of my friends from, from the Illinois team, um, again, could be my, my kid, he's that young, but he, he is in my grill, giving me a hard time about everything all the time. Well, we're in the track, um, in that part of the race and they brought high school cheerleaders out to cheer us on as, as we're completing the lap in there. And I made note of that. So when we were done, I had to ask him if he had hired them to come cheer him on or not. Right. And it's just <laughs> kind of funny how you know, being a young kid, he's like, Oh yeah, they were there just for me, you know, and, and so on. But you do recognize those things. And in the races, um, the crowds are, um, it, it's just hard to express how big a deal the crowds are. And, and when you're going through areas of Chicago marathon and it is deafening loud, right. To where you, you just get chills while you're pushing, you're in the moment, you hear this, and feel this volume coming at you that you can't help but just like, yeah, this is really, really cool. Right. But I think, I think from, from family and friends and all that stuff, um, I, I have to remember that some of them aren't as driven as I am. And some of them aren't as interested in racing like I am. And so I have to talk about other things, <laughs> even though as much as I want to talk about the racing part of it. Um, but I also think that I have to be very aware of how much they support me without me even knowing it. And so I'll have a, a group of friends that will ride along with me. They're in bicycles. I make fun of them when they're done because they get off their bike like they're sore um, because they're old men like me. And you know, we have a good time and, and we go share a, a drink afterwards. And, and, you know, the fact that they just come out, it, it's just something I have to be very aware of that they have invested time in me and granted they're, they're there cause they want to be there. But I think without me suggesting that we go for a ride, I don't know if they would go do it. And so it, it's, it's something that I really have to be aware of, of that, People see what I'm doing, but there are so many people involved that have a part in that. And I have to just be very aware of those things. And then I think the second part is there are people that have helped me years ago in ways that I don't even know, right? They may have donated, they may have spent a half hour of time. And I just have to be really careful that I understand that something that might be going on right now that might not look right, that they've had my back all along, if that makes sense. And so I have to be really careful that I don't dismiss an effort or a comment or, or things that people have made today or maybe haven't made and forget about that. They've been there for the past 10 years, even though I may not have recognized it. Mm. And, And it's, it's weird. When I was leaving, um, I was at Craig Hospital in Denver for my, my rehabilitation. I started in Des Moines for about four weeks, went out to Denver for six weeks. And there was a gentleman that uh, was on the board of the hospital there. It's a spinal cord and brain injury rehab hospital. So there's 30 or 40 of us in wheelchairs learning how to live again. Um, gentleman on the board of the hospital happened to be on the Paralympic rugby team. And I asked him, I said, they're sending me home next week. You know, what am I not ready for? And he said, you're going to find that there are friends that you have, not did have, but you still have, that are going to fade away from you. And they're still friends. They're going to fade away because they 
they just don't know how to handle seeing you going through what you're going through. And then you're going to have other people in your life that have always been there that are going to elevate and be at the forefront and push you. And you never knew that they've been there the whole time. And it's not that you're losing friends or gaining friends. It's just the roles change with some of that. And it's, it's spot on. I've had, I've had folks that for six months, you know, they're, they're over helping out. And now we've kind of fell right back into their good friends, but we don't see them as often as we used to. And, and the investment the folks have made that way, it's just been interesting to, to learn that they're still friends, just that they may not be in the forefront. And a lot of the stuff is that, you know, they're sitting back and seeing what I'm able to accomplish without them having to be involved every day. But I hold a big part of, you, you ask about, about, you know, how does it impact your life and stuff. Um, I'm doing a lot of what I'm doing partially because I feel like I owe it to all of them still for everything they've done for me to show them, look what you did for me, you know, and, and me com- competing and finishing in, in these things is a testament to the support that they've given me. And if it makes them excited about our community and look at this guy and, and he's a friend of mine, um, I'm all in for that. And that, that you know, I, I feel like every day I still owe folks for that. And, and unfortunately my family probably doesn't get the payback as much as I should give them. <laughs> You know what I mean? I think, yeah, I do. I think they're certainly proud. Uh, my daughter, um, if if I need help, she's there in an instant, even if I've just grounded her, right? And and she she gets it that there's a difference between when she's in trouble, she can't really be angry at me if I'm needing help. She's there, you know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's you know you don't run, you don't train at the level you train at at the distances I ran at, I ran a thousand and fifty miles last year, right? And yeah. I've got three kids and a wife and a bit you know mm-hmm. she's home my wife's homeschooling kids because of the pandemic. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm out like taking four and five hours to go run, right? And mm-hmm. the whole time I'm so the uh the fifty miler was a virtual it was ended up being self supported because of the pandemic. And you know, yeah. she was there cheering me on the whole time. The whole time. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that meant the world to me. It still does, right? She's my biggest cheerleader. Um, my just- um, my wife was watching online. She didn't go to Boston with me a couple years ago. She's been to Chicago, and, and Chicago is fun because you go up and back the streets so many times that they get a chance to see you in the race. Multiple yeah, Boston's times. super different. Yeah, it's point to point, right? And she was watching online from home, and like I said, the first 17, 18 miles, she's like, oh, my gosh, he's ahead of his pace. But then online, going up Heartbreak Hill or, you know, whatever they are, my yeah. little iPhone just stopped, right? And she started texting my daughter saying, what happened? I should have been out there. Something's wrong or whatever. It's like, no, it's just a really big hill. And I, you go from like really, miles really big hour, hill. <laughs> yeah, 18 miles an hour downhill to two miles an hour up. So funny story, that hill was so hard on me that – to start the hill, people were cheering out my number, my, come on, go 36, go whatever, right? A couple of folks were walking up the hill beside me, took the time to get the app out to punch in my number and then find my name. And all of a sudden I became Dean and they're cheering for me by name. I was going that slow up the hill. <laughs> so I had time to look it up. And, and my wife's like, oh, I thought something was wrong. Like, no, just there was something wrong, but it was a hill, you know? Oh, yeah. But yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy. The um, I was ahead of goal, so I wanted to break three hours and thirty minutes in Boston. Um, it was mm-hmm. my goal, and uh, I think I did three thirty eight, three thirty nine. So I was close, but didn't get there. Um, and it was on the downhill, like such a different thing for in chair and non in chair athletes. Like mm-hmm. the downhill is just like after all that, all the the, the hills, Newton. And then mm-hmm. you start going downhill and it just starts destroying. So it's just an interesting, sure. it's interesting to hear you talk about what your heart for that race is having ran it. Yeah. Uh, and what, what my heart of the race is as a non inch athlete. Uh, well, it, but it is a, it's a hard, hard, hard course. It's interesting. The training that goes into that as well. And things that I've learned from others that have, um, have been, um, helping me out is a lot of the workouts we do focus on going with the wind or going down a hill meaning that you know we can grind up a hill and go slow and you can grind into the wind 
but can your hands move faster than they have moved before? And by going down a hill, can you can you catch that ring? Can you catch that ring? And there's a point where so many miles an hour where your hand just can't keep up. And so you just have to coast or, or glide down the hill. So in my case, I think, you know, once I hit a, a 22 mile an hour, hmm. I, I cannot I can't move my hand any faster to do it. So we will practice that because you don't get an opportunity to practice speed. You can always practice the weight training side of it into the wind, right? Uh, but it's, it's kind of crazy how it's it's flipped from what you would think. You know, why would you struggle to go into the wind? Well, I'm going to get through that part of the race. The question is, can I go faster on the downs as well? Fascinating. Fascinating. I would, uh, that takes a heck of a lot of courage. I like you hit a bump. Like what? Tell me about this. Cause I'm, I'm never raced in a chair. Like 20, 22 is slow. Really? Oh yeah. So, so best what, what happens the to the chair? If you catch a bump or something like what, like, I don't know. I have never done, <laughs> no, um, <laughs> you know, best, best in the world, right. In a normal scenario. I, um, let me, let me put it this way. Um, best in the world, a wheelchair will beat a runner at 800 meters and beyond, right? Quarter of a mile, the runner's probably going to win. But once you get to a half mile on a track, you know, the best best wheelchairs are going to beat a minute and a half and an 800 meters on a track. Um, when you get out to the road racing, I'm, I'm my goal right now is to, to average 15 miles an hour. So that's an hour 45 marathon. Um, not if even, I can do no marathoners yeah. touching that ever. Well, no, right. They're going to, they're going to aim for, you know, Kip and those guys are going for two hours. Right. Right. But it, 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 it may sound crazy. Right. But understand the wheels I can, I can literally push three or four times and coast for hundred meters where you have to keep running. Right. So there's a, there's a point to where some of that plays out. So you can't do the comparison, but to, to make the comparison happen, right. Best in the world are going to go an hour and 25 minutes. And so I'm 20 minutes slower, 20 minutes slower across the marathon, right? They're, they're clipping at that 18 to 20 mile an hour average, not just downhill. Oh, night. Right. And that's crazy. So, so you think about them, the, the 15 mile an hour for me is a four minute mile on average throughout, right? For them, you know, they're, they're in that 315 average per mile. Just amazing stuff. Just right? flying. So, but, but that comes down to like, if I compare myself to them, why would I even start? And, and exactly. Exactly. Whatever. But going down a hill, um, I'm, you know, we wear a helmet. Um, I think I've good move. Good move. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I've, I think I've capped out around 38 going down a hill once. Oh, um, that's, it was, it was in a, it was in a 20 K and we were coming off a reservoir dam and, <sighs> uh, just tuck and go, you know, um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, um, luckily haven't had any issues there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. That's insane. Yeah. I had a friend it of mine is. ask it's, me one time I was getting ready dumb. to, sorry, go it's ahead. Dumb. It's probably just dumb. Not even insane. Just probably dumb. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend ask me like, Hey, you're going to try to keep up with the Kenyans. I'm like, I would need a bicycle. Are you kidding yeah. me? Like I can't run, like I, you know, I'd blow up my entire race if I tried to keep up with them for a mile. So, well, you know. that's where I'm at. Right. So off the start, if I, if I don't tuck in, we can draft each other just like NASCAR. And it's amazing what that does for, for helping. Right. Do you do a little um, bumping? Do you a little, do a bump and rob? Actually or? front the front wheel absolutely does bump the person in front of you often. Right. Um, but if off the start, if you don't get into one of those groups, you're never going to catch them. And so from that start, that first hundred meters is crucial to try to, to keep up and get after. And if you're on your own, then, you know, you're back to training just like at home, uh, at least that's for me. a long distance. Then. It is, it can be, um, but I'm kind of used to that. And so it's, an, it's gravy for me if, if I get with a group, you know, and understand, I get it. I get it. So I'm curious, like it's so much wisdom here and you shared so much with each one of these questions we've asked you. So thank you so much for yeah. just being such an open book and sharing, you know, sharing all of this sure. for you, like, your racing has, I mean, I can't even imagine barreling down a hill in a wheelchair, head down at those kind of speeds. How has facing those moments of courage transitioned to other opportunities and other events in your life where you've been faced with something that you're a little scared to do, maybe that first time? How has pushing yourself in the chair on the race course 
transitioned to difficult moments in your mm-hmm. life outside of on off the race course? Yeah, I think for the racing, it's been more about excitement to to meet the challenge and as opposed to any fear related to it. Um, you, you always have some imposter syndrome going if you belong and some of that stuff. And, and you can get over that pretty quick, thankfully, with the friends that I had. But I think the, the main thing just from wheelchair life is problem solving is something that is just ingrained in everything I do. Like I have to hang a picture on the wall. How am I going to do that? I'm in a wheelchair. I have to pour myself a gallon of milk, a glass of milk, and the weight of the gallon will throw my balance off. So what do I do about it? And it's these everyday things that it's just a a problem solving thing. So how do I get out of my day chair and into my racing chair? It's just a problem that that needs solved. Um, You know, there's all sorts of those things. And once I'm in the chair and moving, that's just fine, right? Uh, But there's a lot of things that... Um, I tend to tend to <laughs> I tend to think I'm unstoppable um, in, in that um, fine there isn't a place for me to park it's okay I will be just fine I'm still going to beat you to the door you know <laughs> it, it, you know there, there's there's things like that that man I could be very upset that that you know at Walmart there's no handicap spot for me and I see somebody walking out and whatever I don't let it bother me I'm like yeah whatever you know. But there's, there's things that way that it's just another challenge and another problem to solve. And most of them are so simple. If you mm. just, if you don't dig your heels in first, like we were talking about earlier, I mean, you, you can complain about it or just go. Um, and so, you know, as, as an example, I tend to be really, really fast in the grocery store because I will throw everything in my lap. I'll zip around. I load the cart up and go get the next bunch while the family's holding the list and they're still in the freezer aisle. I'm like, I'm zipping around and, and getting everything <laughs> to get out of there, you know? And, um, you know, it's just, it's just part of life. Uh, so it's, it's not really a fear thing, uh, you know, thinking of, of some of the fear stuff, you know, the first time flying had nothing to do with flying in a wheelchair. It had to do with unknown without knowing what and how they would manage me being in a wheelchair. I didn't care about flying. I've done that a million miles, right? But what are they going to do with my chair? Is my chair going to come back in one piece? You know, I've had I've had a wheelchair wheel broken when it arrived at me coming off the plane. So how do you get home? You know, it's it's that sort of stuff that um, you just you have to keep pushing through it, and and it's it's less about fear and more about um, attacking the problem and and come up with a resolution. What problem are you still trying to figure out then? Oh boy, <laughs> how to be a better parent? Um, mm. My my youngest is seventeen, and you know um, they don't want you around. They don't need you around. They think right, except when they're hungry, <laughs> you know. But I I probably should spend less time on trying to solve that problem or win that challenge and just be more present with being. And, you know, as a parent, you, you want so much for your kids. You just express that with your second grader. Um, but sometimes it's not what they want. And so to find a way to, especially as, you know, she's, she's on the cusp, she'll be a senior next year. She'll be having to make some choices as to what she plans to do. Um, and it's a challenge for me to understand that that's, not my choice. I have to be supportive through that. And so I, I know I could do a lot better that way. Um, and I think that that equates to being a lot better for the entire family. If I can continue to try to get better at that. I love that. It's not easy, is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> every day, every day there's something. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I think, I think, uh, especially men, like, you know, mm-hmm. we don't often talk about you know, the challenges and of parenting and it's not easy. Like, you mm-hmm. know, it's wonderful. It's extraordinarily rewarding. I wouldn't trade it for all the money in the world. Um, yeah. but it's very hard to sit in a moment with your child that you would want something different and just allow it to be mm-hmm. without trying to fix it or change it for anyone you love, like for just men in general, like I kind of just want to fix all your problems and tell you how to solve them. And you know, like it's very hard. Yeah. 
Yeah, you, absolutely pull those through it. Yeah. Have you seen the uh, video? Uh, it's it's a husband and wife talking. It's called "It's Not About the Nail" on YouTube. Have you seen this? Uh-uh. No, oh, I'll be look. I'll look it up. Yeah, you got to look it up. It's the the wife has literally a nail in her head, and it's you know obviously it's not actually like yeah, yeah. you know, but yeah. it's all about she's trying to talk about this problem, the nail, and yeah. he's trying to solve it the whole time, right? And it's evident that this conversation's happened a whole lot of times, yeah. right? And he keeps trying to fix it, and she's like, I just want to talk about my problem. I want to talk about the nail. I don't, don't need to fix it. it. Yeah. Don't fix it. Nice. I just want to talk about it. And you That's can see great. him struggling to just sit great. in that moment. It's hard. Yep. It's it hard. is. And, and the, the thing with, with my daughter, and, and she's my third, right? So she's my youngest and my third. Um, would you please just take breakfast, please? You, how do you start the day without any food in your stomach? I'm not hungry. I'm like, oh, but you're going to be in an hour. Can you please just... And, and that simple conversation drives me nuts. I'm like, I'm, I, please trust my wisdom that you need some food in your stomach, right? But you know how many kids are that way? And it's it, it's not like it's a, a battle or a fight. It's just like, oh, how do you how do you not get it? <laughs> your body needs energy, right? Um, but you, maybe you she's on. intermittent fasting. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, my, uh, yeah. so my oldest is crazy brilliant, just nuts, brilliant, bright, like nuts. Right. And so mm-hmm. there's times it feels like I'm raising an adult, like legitimately an adult. And she'll ask me questions. Like she'll be checking my work. Right. And that's a real opportunity for, for me to grow. Cause I'm yeah. like, um, please stop. Like yeah. you are, you know, uh, we're, we're good. You know, I promise, like, I promise I've got you know, I got you. I promise I got you. Like, you don't need to check my work, right? Like exhale and be a kid, you know? Mm-hmm. And with all of our children, with all of those leadership opportunities, whether they're our kids or employees, it's understanding and meeting people where they are so often. Mm-hmm. It's being okay meeting people where they are. Not measuring, it's it's taking your principle and flipping it, right? This idea that measuring our ourselves against ourself and then also making sure we aren't doing that to the people we lead. That we aren't yeah. taking our yardstick and laying it against them and saying you need to be here. It's allowing them to have that same permission, giving them permission to do the same thing, which is yeah, not you easy. Can, you can want, you can want for them, but that's a lot different than commanding it. So true, so true. So, goodness, Dean, I could t- I could talk to you for hours, man. This is good stuff. Yeah, this is can, good stuff. Um, I'm hoping you got in uh, to the Boston. Uh, you'll have to share yeah. with us your bid if you did. So we can watch yeah. for this this fall. I'd kind of had, had checked out last with COVID, with racing, with the injury I've got. I kind of had checked out because I know this is going to be an interesting year. My wife and I are expecting number four in October. So, you yeah. know, I'm hoping I can beg for the permission slip to train for a marathon um, and give that a go and see if that can fit in, slip that in. But yeah. I hadn't I hadn't paid attention to what Boston had done. So that's exciting. So they're doing it in October. Is that when it is? They, they are. And um I'm going to probably do something I probably shouldn't do, but um, Chicago is on a Sunday, October, whatever that Sunday is. Are you going to go back to back? Yeah. So, <laughs> so Chicago is that Sunday and Boston's the Monday. So um, it's like the 12th and the 13th or something like that of October. And then Des Moines has a half that next Saturday or Sunday. So I'm going to do, the three in the week, but, but again, the wheelchair is different. So, so think about Chicago for a second. We start at, let's say seven 30. Um, we're in the cool down tent at nine 30. Right. So, so, so first of all, we're not running. Right. And in fact, I remember being in Boston in the hotel, getting out of the shower and looking down and people are still finishing the race. I'm like, <laughs> what's taking you so long? Right. I mean, <laughs> it's what it is. But no, we'll be we'll be done and more than likely able to hop on a plane early afternoon, get to Boston, attend the wheelchair meeting that night and, and race in the morning. And um, because I'm not feeding my family by racing, oh, yes. darn, I finish in two hours and 10 minutes instead of two hours and five minutes. I mean, you know, oh, darn, you know, it's right. It's a big but, but it'll be fun and I won't be the only one doing it. Uh, and, and I say that in that I just registered for Boston this morning. Um, we'll find out, you know, a week or two, if I get in, if I get in, then yeah, why not? You know, 
let's just go for it. Yeah, I can't even, I mean, I did a, uh, in part of my training, I did a 31 on a Friday and a six mile, mm -hmm. six mile or 10 mile or the next day. Right. So yeah. when you do some of the ultra distance, you get some pretty heavy back to back days, but, uh, -huh. uh you know, you just manage, you manage, you know, each of them is a little bit, you know, different approach for each one of them. Were you, yeah. have you thought about it? Will you go harder Chicago or harder Boston or, you, you know, have you yeah. thought about where, how you're going to play that? Um, the races are so different. Chicago's a grind. It is flat, largely, isn't it? It's, yeah, flat, it's flat, and and because of the way it goes back and forth, you're never gonna have a tailwind the entire time. You're gonna you're gonna have a couple of miles into a wind, and then turn around and have it at your back. And um, the best I've done in Chicago is a 205. I would love to break two hours in Chicago, and it, because it's a lot like training here at home because it is so flat. Um, but you know, I'm not looking to set a PR there. I think, um, you know, Boston will be what it is. It'll be my second time there. So I think I'll be a lot more, I'll be a lot less scared going to Boston. Right. I remember last year I actually had a miniature elevation map that I taped to the frame of my chair at Boston to know when I was getting closer to the Hills. So I knew at mile 10, there's going to be a Hill coming at 11 and I'll be less OCD about it, I think, <laughs> you know, next time. But, you know, I think the big thing is eight weeks um, away, we've got something called grandma's marathon in Duluth. So that's the the first big race of getting back into things. I'm super excited to, to finally get back and, and racing again up there and we'll see how that one goes. I love it. Well, so, Dean, thank you so much for yeah, your wisdom. You. Um, really appreciate you sharing your story, what you've learned through this journey um, we'll make sure to link the TED Talk to the show yeah. notes. Um, is there any other ways that people can connect with you other than the TED Talk? Are you on social media, Instagram, anything yeah. like that? If people want to connect yeah. with you, know Be more about your yeah, story. Yeah, best one's linked. No, you're fine. Best one's LinkedIn, or you can find me on Facebook as well. Um, I haven't really gotten into a lot of the Instagram stuff. There's so many platforms, right? So many. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a Twitter account, but I don't tweet. I follow people and just get updates about sports teams and so on. Uh, but LinkedIn is, is pretty big in Facebook, but by all means, um, if people are in a similar situation or just need a nudge, reach out. I enjoy the discussion and conversation and it's selfish because it helps me keep perspective and it helps me be better as well. So, uh, by all means, if, if there's folks that want to reach out, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the greatest processes and gifts we can have is to pay it forward to somebody else who's in a, who's mm -hmm. in a, in their own journey, in their own place. So. I just want to thank you for that again. This has been an incredible conversation. So much sure. wisdom, so much impact. So I've got one last question for you before we let you go. Dean. Okay. What What does legacy on purpose mean to you? <laughs> Why did you leave the hard question for last? That's the question. Um, <laughs> you got to finish uphill. You got to finish yeah, yeah. with the sprint it, at the it, finish, absolutely right? Absolutely right. Um, I, I think that there's just a lot of, being intentional uh, about everything. So, you know, we've talked about being present. We've talked about what you learn. Um, I don't, I don't do well with randomness being in the wheelchair. If things come out of left field and, and I'm not ready to react to them, it, it can really throw things for a loop. And so um, being very intentional about what I'm doing is, is what I think helps me build, if you want to call it a legacy, right? Um, so whether it's on purpose or not, for me, there's a reason I'm doing the training. There's a reason I'm doing the marathons. There's a reason I'm doing all those things. Um, and if that culminates to a, a larger body of work that, um, looks interesting, then, then to me, that's a bonus. I think it's just a matter of putting it together every day. I love it. I love it. Dean, thank you so much. Truly you a bet. gift to spend time with you and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, they, they canceled the Indy mini, but hopefully maybe you and I can, uh, join part of it. You, you kick my butt, but maybe we can do, do a little running together someday. Next year, we'll be out there. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much. so much. You bet. Nice work, man. Let me get some everything stopped. Oh. No, you're good. That was great.